Now I get to introduce uh, Dr. Rajesh Gupta, who's a professor at the, of computer science and engineering at the University of California, San Diego. He's an expert in robotics. I couldn't read the rest of his uh, resume. I, I couldn't understand the words. It's all very complicated. If you read it yourself, you, you may understand it, but I couldn't. I know that it's way cool, um, and that's about it. Thank you, Bill. That is the sweetest introduction I ever had. Uh, where is the mystery? Where is the magic? I tell you, um, this has been a fascinating panel for me. The view from there is a lot better than the view from here, because you get to see the slides. I mean, you are all very handsome and beautiful, but really. Um, what I'm going to do is... Um, relate to you a personal journey into the kind of work that I've been doing and how it intersects with healthcare. And um, <clears throat> as Bill said, um, my training is in mathematical sciences. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do is um, give you sort of an outline, the context to a context. How did I end up in a healthcare uh, conference today? And how does it relate to what we do? In particular, healthcare is the most compelling application for robotics. And robotics itself is changing. It's not just about an automaton but it's actually more about data analytics. In the robotics itself, the context is changing robotics, and we actually call it contextual robotics. What I want to do is to give you a vision of how robotics is changing. And then <clears throat> the engineer in, engineer in me, I used to build chips in, in a previous life, um, always looks, to, uh, looks at things in a very structured way. Now, when you put an engineer to look at the healthcare, how does that person see the healthcare? And that's something that uh, um, might be eye-opening to some people here. And when you take the engineer's view of life, human health, and healthcare, how do you see the future? And hopefully, that will be my closing thoughts. <clears throat> so, in last... Um, I would say 10 years or so, I have been busy building institutions, uh, more so than pursuing a singular research agenda. And when you build institutions, um, you think about things, for example, what is the intellectual driver for whatever institution we're building? What does it look like academically? What programs it has? What does it look like institutionally? What processes it has? What spaces it has? What facilities it has? And it normally always uh, boils down to, to mundane decisions like hiring faculty, creating education plans, facilities, and, and uh, translation or, or industry partners. So one of the exercises I've been engaged with in the last um, uh, two years specifically is driving UCSD's uh, agenda into robotics. Robotics is a, is a pretty advanced area. In fact, uh, UCSD is, uh, has had quite a bit of individual research, but as an institution, it actually is, is, uh, is, a, is a later uh, comer to, to, to many institutions. So the question that I was challenged with is that if I'm building an institute today to s advance robotics, where will that look like in 10 years from now? Which problems must it be solving? And so, uh, and that produced this document that actually became the, the, um, the, the guiding light for, for the UC San Diego to actually con um, build this uh, institute together. I'm going to skip all the administrative uh, parts, all the academic politics parts, and all the things that we have to do, and just focus on intellectual aspects today. If you look at the robotics, it actually is fascinating. 
if you if you look at uh, uh, I don't know how many of you look, looked at the the dog or the bulldog from Boston Dynamics. You know the big machine it makes a lot of noise, but but it goes over all kinds of terrains. And uh, you know you kick it, it gets up and it moves on, and it doesn't have eyes. I mean it does such a, it's a phenomenal kinetics uh, visions. Uh, uh, did you know that when you take a picture today, your camera is seeing more than your eyes can see? You could not say that before. Right? Your cameras today can read your heart rates easily. You cannot do that. And so is speech, uh, is speech processing, uh, I'm told, is a solved problem where now the, the, the understanding of speech, at least in, in quiet environments, has about the same error rate as a human listener has, and in my case, probably better. Um, Manufacturing is already really changed by robotics. There are some very common features to robotics. In fact, the word robot actually literally means doing menial and repetitive tasks. I think from Hungarian and Polish or some other language. Um, so the common features in robotics have been the joints very stiff, very predictable motions, and very repetitive behaviors. You think of an assembly line. You expect a robot to actually perform a certain way. The, in the interaction between humans and robots, the adaptive agent was human, not the robot. Now, that doesn't mean the robots cannot be adapted. In fact, the two robots I'm showing you, um, uh, the PR2 is like the most commonly sought after robot for any robotic researcher today. You know, as, as in my role as a chair, I am in the position of hiring faculty, and one of the things they ask for is, can I buy a PR2? Well, it just only costs half a million dollars, okay? Um, uh, and, um, or KUKA Robotics, uh, which is like the most multipurpose, most programmed arm that is currently used today. So if you look at these robots, they actually are already on a trajectory in the industry, in the practice where they're doing things, clearly. This is not where you would be investing your time and energy in advancing knowledge, because that knowledge exists, is being practiced. In fact, <clears throat> it is very common, and uh, you know, Vijay made a very good point. You, know, you, you look at an iPhone, it has you know, many million times more power than computational power than the machines that, uh, that uh, took us to the moon and so on. And we often like to say there will be an inflection point, you know, singularity, where uh, someday the, 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 your phone or your whatever device you have will exceed the storage capacity or processing capacity of human brain. And therefore, by implication, is smarter than humans. And I tell them that no amount of processing power will ever give you intelligence until you understand mistake and error until you understand uncertainty and deal with uncertainty. The humans are the best machines to navigate between the black and white, the gray. And so you need more than in adaptivity, and you need a bit more than predictability. In fact, best music is somewhat unpredictable. Gary Kasparov, when he lost the first chess match, you know how he lost it against Watson? Watson made a un familiar move, which clearly was a mistake to Kaspera. And that made him nervous. This, this thing is doing something I cannot figure out. Right? And it turns out, later on, that that move was due to a programming error. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the point I make is, that our ability to understand and respond to error and precision is at the core of the intelligence that we seek. I recognize an object, uh, you know, right now machines can recognize a number plate, if an apple on a kitchen counter. In fact, they might even have a robot that can work with me in the kitchen, though not that I want one, but, or maybe in the garden, right? But when I pick up an object, it's in the context. Do I squish it? How hard do I pick it up? Do I gently pick it up? Do I have to lift it up? Right? What can I do? What I must not do it. I, I can reach for something, uh, you know, on a dinner table, you know, there's that salt shaker is sitting there. I can generally, you know, you ask the person, can you pass me the salt? And a robot can simply lift your arm and grab that. Do you think that is the right behavior? No. Right? So understanding this, understanding what the context tells you to do. 
Our conclusion was, is after the whole report and so on, context is part of the intelligent life. And actually, it's almost going towards the Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein days of, of actually, the language is not just logic, it's the context too. So inferring context in uncertain environment is absolutely important. And um, in future, our ability to decipher context will be central to advances in robotics. Uh, if one, the, the picture that the below is, uh, is, uh, is Todd Helton, his face doesn't show up, talking to a robot um, as, a, as a brain corp uh, company, a startup company, that actually after it performs certain actions, now it learns some of those actions to what to do and what not to do next time. So context gives you a social awareness. Now, we engineers are very used to giving you busy slides. You know, I wish I had a few more circuits this little and, and mastering music. So you don't have to read all of it. But there are three things that fall out. The context gives you some way of telling you what capabilities you can apply. For example, do you want a chatty robot? Or do you want a robot in a healthcare room to just change your bed and not talk to you? Right? Or do you want a robot to actually listen to you and talk less? Or do you want a robot to only talk, especially answering one of the spam calls? Right? How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, and how about you? Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, point is, a robot talking to a robot, that's great. Right? Sometimes a robot may be in my personal space, maybe in my bathroom. You don't want a robot to have eyes. In fact, you don't want a robot to do anything other than what a robot is supposed to do, right? So you can derive new capabilities from context. One of the, the, the areas that um, actually advanced in UCSD at Hutchins and his group is called distributed cognition. And, and it's an area where you actually learn things and you understand things from the environment in which objects are also agents of learning your paper and pencil, your iPhone, or your robotic element is also part of your understanding of the environment. And then you change the context. You actually can change, understanding the context allows you to change the context, turn off the lights, turn off the lines, or you change the vocabulary you're gonna use. Uh, long time ago when I did my thesis, in my um, uh, piece of software that we built, uh, I built in a mode called abuse mode. Uh, and, and what happens is invariably somebody who's using the tool will get frustrated and say, what the hell? The moment you type hell or anything else in four letters, it goes into abusive mode and it actually it replies you back in the same way. Uh, <laughs> and then the menu changes. <laughs> this actually happened, I did that. Um, uh, and, and, so, and that was great entertainment. <laughs> so this is what, if you're an engineer, or if you're married to an engineer, you will understand what I'm saying. Uh, the engineers like to look at the problem as a box, what is in, what is out. And sometimes when you do that at home and you look at a problem like that, it doesn't work that way. So there's an input, there's output. It's not that the engineers are simple-minded. They want to know what they can change, what they cannot change. They can be very complex. They can be internal dynamical systems which, uh, which have a moving part. That's all fine, there's feedback. But there's an in, there's an out. So now when I put my hat on of an engineer, look at healthcare or even human health, I say, what, what is the in here and what is the out? So let me give you my way of looking at it. Human health is really a function, a mathematical function. You, you, your inputs are your genomic data, the 23 and me's, which is SNPs, but maybe more. Um, epigenetic data, maybe even your lifestyle, the coffee you drink and the vaccines you had or did not want to have, or your parents. These are all inputs. And then the phenotypes, and there are a large number of them now, from your blood test to your own monitoring of, uh, of, uh, in, of things at home, uh, your blood sugars and so on, to maybe even imaging of all kinds. These are all your phenotype data. So those are the outputs. Now, much of the biology really connects the changes in inputs to the changes in outputs. You know, if you had this genetic variation, then this will cause this much thing. And of course, uh, the diagnosis is a little bit, clinical diagnosis is very different from human biology, which is why you never take a biologist and put them in clinic. Uh, you put them at least another 10 years before they get there. Because biology is, the diagnostics is a process of matching 
and categorizing this input-output pairs into something that you can put your hands on. Oh, yeah, that's a blood cancer. Oh, no, that's just a flu, or that's Zika virus, or whatever. Right? Now, in the process, there are a lot of intermeasure that comes up, which are intermeasure measurements. Uh, for example, every morning, I, I'm a runner, so every morning I get up, I measure my heart rate variability, and then I run five miles. If the variability is very high, I run at seven miles. If it's low, then I run three miles. And if it is very low, then I don't run. So, <laughs> right? So that's, that's how it works. But anyway, so those are, these are all measurement data, you know. And all of these sensors that I show you, uh, the EKGs, uh, the, uh, the, um, these are sensors in my, my um, socks and so on, uh, I actually own them. Uh, and so I, so I go to the doctor and I take my 23 and me printout and then I take out my, my blood pressure measurement printout, which is every twice a day for a whole month, entire plots and so on. And the doctor looking at me and saying, is this a nutcase? <laughs> Which actually they don't need to, but, but that's what happens. So it is overwhelming physicians. It's no longer one number. You actually have time from waveforms and so on. So you do need a way. You do need a way between you, the doctor, and the data to mediate this information transfer. Because it is really silly. They're going to take one measurement of my blood pressure when I'm actually giving you a whole month data. Please, take a look at it. And, and here are the principal components, by the way. <laughs> but what the hell is a principal component? Oh, never mind. Um, right? So, so you do need to mediate technology that mediates that. And this is where the interfaces are coming up. And by the way, this one button thing is so true that Scott pointed out. You know, in fact, uh, one of uh, friends, Yulung Wang, uh, who's the CEO of InTouch Health, um, he puts it very nicely, and this is his slide, um, that you have all this big data stuff, and you have a physician, and then you got the patients. The bottleneck is here. This is actually looks like a bottle, a neck of a bottle, right? And so, so of course, they produce some kind of a telehealth. In fact, their product, telehealth, uh, did 80,000 stroke uh, diagnosis. That is more than Mayo Clinic, or more than entire UC system clinics. Come on, just one company. So yes, if you do have robotic assist, which is in this case just telehealth, there is no there is no intelligence being used. It's just the doctor being exported across uh, to other locations virtually. Can do more. Can actually take the, the technology in the put it in the middle of the patient and the doctor. We don't want that, do we? Well, actually, you do. Why you do? Because you can actually see more things. You probably have seen this application, or some variant of that, which is you look at your camera, and it tells you your heart rate is this, and your breathing rate is this. Please slow down. <laughs> and you say, wait a second. If I had that on my eyeglasses, when I'm talking to you, your heart rate goes up. I know you're lying, or you you got to go somewhere else, right? <laughs> this can happen. Or you can have a doctor looking at it and doing a, a augmented reality, looking at the, the same data under ultrasonic or IR. And you can actually superimpose right there. There's no doctor today with a bionic eye that can do that. But, but you can do that if you put technology in the middle. In fact, one of the companies that just got bought by Apple is called Emotient. It's, uh, it's a startup from UCSD. Um, and it actually looks at your face and says, well, you're angry or you're disgusted or you're uninterested. Right? Now, imagine if you're a doctor and you're paying attention to these details and actually your, your better care that will come out. Of course, you, you, there will be explosion in terms of what you have to pay attention to, but this is technologically possible. Um, European Commission did a study and I, I, and I, with 50 experts and they actually took 21 different domains of areas where, uh, where technology is changing um, uh, um, uh, healthcare. And, and, and this is about eight years old slide, so which means all these, uh, uh, these uh, things have shifted rightwards. Okay. Now, you don't have to read that, but here is what the summary of that is. The three categories, mobility and manipulation, therapy, and surgery, that have now come into practice. I already told you about telehealth, um, a surgery. You probably know about the telesurgery like uh, Da Vinci that, you know, they have a very nice, very famous YouTube video of, of a surgeon peeling a grape. And uh, actually, you should take a look at it. And why they want to do that, that's not the point. The point is that they can actually do it <laughs> um, uh, uh, robotically, right? 
So the point is that this, the, 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 the robotics is not just mechanics. Robotics is just not, which actually is important, by the way. In fact, one of the biggest injuries that the, the RNs and the physician assistants have is back injury. And the reason is turning the patients over and up and again, this is not easy stuff, okay? So you do need that kind of assistance, you do need the muscles, but you also need sometimes the chatty one, sometimes the shut up one, sometimes the one that actually gives you data. So um, now this is very detailed of the actual research that needs to be done. Uh, and, and so I said, well, it, the three main thrusts in which the research is organized, and we have faculty members, have now about 40, 45 faculty members across the entire campus working on it. One is on sensing and perception, whose goal is to create socially adapted agents. Uh, the second is, uh, is cognition, uh, cognition and coordination, and the third is mobility and manipulation. It might be hard for you to follow these terms. You can say, see, think, do, hopefully in that order. Doesn't really matter, but point is, <laughs> You have see, think, do, right? Now, that part, by the way, applies to a lot of domains, automated driving to healthcare to, and so on. In healthcare, I just tell, in mobility manipulation, you actually have equipments coming up that helps you with this turning patients and so on. Going forward, I see the intermediary, not just the remote one, not just the muscle ones, not just the, the, uh, the finer muscle control one, uh, but even the language assist and so on, is intermediating and enabling uh, a distributed cognition approach between the humans. It could be doctor doctors, it could be doctor patients, and so on. And underlying all of that are algorithms, architectures, and, and programming. Uh, software is eating the word. Uh, uh, Vijay was quite right in, in that that it is the the it is the calculus of tomorrow, except that the calculus that is still evolving. And so, <clears throat> let me put all these thoughts together and sort of bring these points uh, as to what how I see it. Um, I, at the heart, I'm a technologist, so I'm always wowed by not one button, but all the moving parts. But but in terms of the disruptions that will happen. Um, delivery is still a number one challenge. And I was fascinated by Lee's talk. I didn't know it was so complex on the back end in terms of all these uh, private public exchanges and so on. Um, let's put this slide, okay, let's see. Um, uh, private public exchanges uh, and how, what the trade-off that goes on. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the uh, delivery and access will consume, especially in this presidential year now, when who's gonna pay for them, you know, when you have an inverted pyramid where, where you probably have maybe more than one senior being supported on one income, maybe it will be that Mexican immigrant, I don't know. Um, uh, so it's a civil, evolving, a society that is evolving, a demographics that is changing. Uh, a number that I found fascinating is that the life expectancy is increasing about one year per three to four years. That's the sort of slope of the curve. And of course, people like me and, and, and others who are collecting a lot of data, and that later will somehow, sooner or later, will have to find its way in the healthcare system. The healthcare diagnostics, the function I told you about mapping the intermediates and the inputs and the outputs and so on, um, it is definitely stretching the limits of not just storage or computing. Even the methods we know, to be honest with you, if anybody tells you in computer science that this is something we can do, they don't know what you're talking about. Because unlike math, the algorithms that are needed to navigate data have not been invented yet, let alone being applied. So that area is still rapidly advancing. Um, I see three areas of opportunities and challenges, both. One is diagnostics. The second is social robotics, uh, or you can call it chatty robotics, or you call it socio-technical robotics. And the third is uh, expanding mobility and manipulation. Um, let me say a little bit about that, uh, soft robotics especially. Uh, I saw the other day uh, at our kitchen a plastic knife. Uh, no, not the plastic, it's some kind of a polymer. It's actually, you can cut many things. And I said, oh my God, look at this. So my wife is saying, why? It was, what's fascinating about this? I said, look, imagine if a surgeon had a like, knife like that, and you can insert it into a, a catheter or something, and it, and it had some flexible material also, then I can be imaging it at the same time. You can't imagine if you have a metal, right? And now you can actually have some image direct or surgery or so on. And then, of course, I went and told with my colleagues, we have a very, school, good, uh, very uh, active school of medicine. They said, yeah, yeah, we are doing that. 
And uh, in fact, we have a researcher now, Michael Lippi, who just hired last year, who works in soft robotics, just enabling these kind of technologies. At the end, it's a big philosophical change that is happening in biology and in healthcare. Engineers are not satisfied with knowing the world the way it is. To the scientists and to the healthcare, this is how, you know, here's a glucose that gets multiplied into these, these parts. Oh, look, I found out the entire chain. We ask the question, what if I want a different outcome? What do I need to change then? That's a synthetic view. That is a driven view. You actually look to change the biological processes themselves. And I think we are between computational biology and our understanding of advanced differentials of biology. We are coming to that point, where, whether we call it systems biology or synthetic biology or computational biology or quantitative biology, they're all coming together to that world view. You know, all of these things, prognostications and, 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 and future ideas and so on, they don't happen by alone. And of course, I take a credit for a lot of work that is done by other people. This particular work of uh, contextual uh, um, robotics, actually, I had, a, I had a pleasure to work with some of the fine, finest brains at UCSD, uh, five of them, I put their name up there. Uh, uh, Nuno Vasconcela is uh, from Electro Engineering, Virginia Disa from Cognitive Sciences, the only Cognitive Science department in the country. Javier Movilan, uh, Qualcomm Institute, he is the co-founder of the Emotient I mentioned to you, the company that uh, Apple bought, Tom Bewley in Mechanical Engineering, and David Kurz, who taught me all about distributed cognition. So my thanks to, to the team and the technology that is coming up, my thanks to your attention and time um, for, for giving me a chance to actually learn about what is going on in healthcare. It is absolutely a fascinating time. <laughs> One final question. Did anybody recognize the picture I put up in my uh, opening slide and last slide? What is that picture? is from a movie called Martin Scorsese's movie, Hugo. If you have not seen it, please do. What's it called? <laughs> Hugo. Hugo? Yeah. Thank you. We have time, we have time for some questions. Um, if you'll wait until you have a microphone and introduce yourself and where you're from. May I follow up on the big data question? A hundred years ago, to, hundred years ago, Flexner was hired by Carnegie to evaluate and standardize medicine in America. Out of that came what we call scientific method. And because of our costs and our lack of performance, we've seen the growth of standardized best care practices, which are essentially population-derived statistical analysis of medical care. Yet, what you've touched upon is the disruption of that entire system, and this is, has effects on us. We are, the physicians are being graded, and ultimately, financially, we will have implications for ourselves and our hospitals on how we apply best care, standardized best care practices. Yet, what you have touched on, which we have not covered here, is the concept of personalized medicine. Companies like TGen, 23andMe, et cetera, have now blown through the concept of standardized care. The individual reaction to drugs and treatments, et cetera, are not at all covered. In fact, they're erroneously covered and masked by best care practices. To be able to go after personalized care with the technology that you touched on is a revolution that is not at all touched upon or nor I haven't heard any concept, concepts of it yet as how we're going to deal with this as far as insurance carriers. And here we are, 100 years later, and we are back to the beginning. Flexner is now out, out, obsolete. Could you comment on that? that term around very loosely and say this is a big blue revolution, but 
So revolutions of consequences in the following way. So there's this, this structure that we use for business models, and you see crossover analysis being a great example, very different business models. You know, before and after a technological <coughs> revolution uh, are, are actually quite different. Uh, and there's winners and losers, so the companies are so, so uh, the process of adaptation is actually quite slow. I mean, you see this in self-driving cars as well, but there's, you know, the state of California, for example, says the human being must be touching the wheel at all times, and the National Highway well, the Administration came up and said, no, actually, it's okay, because the Google car is safer than most of us, because we're all distracted. I mean, every time you see somebody driving at 30 miles an hour on a freeway, you, you can look and you'll see this with this. Um, but it, it, you know, it will take a longer time than I think people anticipate with the social change and business change is always hard. But I think these things do co-evolve and, and as the technologies are more and more. I spent a day earlier this week with a big pharmaceutical company. And this is their big sort of focus right now because they understand that um, personalized medicine is where it's at. Uh, and I think there will be special health plans that will come, you know, come forward and disrupt sort of the traditional health plan if they don't adapt. Um, and I think there's a lot of learning that needs to happen too. So, so. Yes. So let me, um, let me uh, add to that question. Medicine has always been personalized. I mean, you go to a doctor and the doctor says, oh yeah, so there works in the hypochondriac again. Um, and so, uh, and, and you look at the, uh, the it's, so the care is, has been personalized. What has changed dramatically and what will change dramatically is not personalization, is precision. And, and precision, what I mean by that is that you are precise in your uh, uh, treatment, in your doses, in your target, at the cellular level, at the molecular level, at the organ level, or at the population level, with the data that guides your decision making, that is precise. What has been guiding? You know, they have been uh, plotting my children's uh, growth curves uh, based on the average data of kids uh, sampled in Minnesota. I mean, come on, you know, this is an Indian. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you'll be five percentile, so what? Um, uh, so, so the point is that 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 precision is changing. And, 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 and the great part is, I think this is what the doctors are finding very uncomforting and, 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 and discomforting. I, I, a lot of uh, very great personal physician friends and so on, and I look into them and I say, dude, you must be able to tell your doctor, tell your patient, I really don't know. Somehow you have taken the mental which you, you know, the patient sees you as a god or some incarnation of it, that somehow you will fix everything. And you actually don't know. <laughs> and if, until you come to that point, forget about giving confidence to your patient. You're not giving confidence. When the patient can look through and say, all you did was look at a blood pressure data right now and you made a conclusion about what medication I will take. When I'm telling you, here is how it, my blood pressure changes through the day and through the night. Right? So, that part of humility and that part of training is missing. And, and one of the things that we are doing now at uh, UCSD is actually we go across the School of Medicine and say, unlike physical world, in a physical world when a plane falls down or when a car breaks down, if you spend enough time, you can figure out what actually went wrong. The unknowns in the biological world are too many. There are people who fall down, there are people who, who just die, and you ask the doctor what happened, I don't really know. This is not an unknown, uh, unheard of. So I think that is the big cultural change that will happen. I don't know if that answers the question, but I see right. the precision definitely changing many yes, things. I wanted to comment on precision medicine for a brief second. Last Friday, North Shore Long I LIJ, now known as Northwell, started asking all patients who are going to be put on a blood thinner to have a genetic test specifically to test their metabolism for Pradaxa as a relative. 30% of patients can't metabolize that. And so if, that, if they can't metabolize that, the patients fall and bleed and you get those commercials on TV. Did you take Xarelto? Did you take Pradaxa? Um, so now, we're going to be able to screen the 30% of patients who can't metabolize that medication and treat them more appropriately. And I thought this was fascinating and one of the first steps in precision medicine on a grand scale. We have another question here. 
Cindy Enos. Um, as we ha are increasingly solving access to insurance, I think access to good care has uh, continued to be very compromised by the inability of many practitioners to have cultural context and language um, capabilities that are shared with the patient. Um, my daughter, who's a first year resident, doesn't complain about the hours she's spending. She's spending her hours uh, co concerned about the fact that she's not communicating with her patients who need to understand what bilirubin <clears throat> is. So I just wondered, are, there, uh, are you aware of advances in language interpretation capabilities at the point of care that would be um, able to address in California 53 different languages across the state? Yeah, here's my answer. FaceTime. Um, there's a lot of services now, translation services that I can access immediately to help me and be in the room with me with the patient's permission. Um, that is an incredible challenge though because um, certainly as emergency medicine physician, primary care, there's so many cues that you need to get from the story or if it's not quite in context that you can take you down the wrong road. So, um, but I do think technologies like this um, are very helpful to access those types of services. Uh, just to pile on to the other question was, um, you know, we're, we're a group that would love to adopt these technologies. I tell you what, when a patient comes in with their 23andMe report, I have no idea what to do with it. Awesome, you're, you know, from Africa, this co combination, I don't know what to do with that yet. What I love is this story about, like, as soon as we have a study or a test that can help me define who really needs the cumin and who needs that, I want to be the first to implement it. We think we're in a model that allows us to do that. We're not waiting for reimbursement to try new stuff out. And so that's what, hopefully, there might be some innovative ways you can start to thread some of these in there. But we are more than happy to adopt new technology. It's just hard to figure out how to do that. And this is a great example, too, your translation thing. There's a service that I can quickly access on my phone. I'm bringing it into the room with me, and it solves my problem. So. Thank you. We have a question over here. My name is Vijay Dar, and uh, I'm from Children's Hospital of Orange County, Chalk Children's Hospital. just want to change the topic because it is a very illustrious panel in front of us. Um, and something of interest to me, and obviously you read in the last 24 hours, this crossing of line between Apple technologies and the security needs of the country. Uh, specifically mentioning uh, the rights, rights of privacy of a society, and apparently Apple is in charge of that, and the security needs of society. And the government claims that the FBI is responsible for that. So when these lines cross like they have, any opinion, any of the panel members, starting with you, Vijay, my co-name? Well, um, <laughs> you know, we, we debated this at home yesterday. Um, and my wife and I ended up with opposite ends of the spectrum. So, so that, so, so it, 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 it's, a, and I've been tracking this, is my mic on? No, uh, it, I've been tracking sort of the, you know, you, you have to go online and I read left-wing blogs and right-wing blogs and, Try and read the comments, and other, you, you got to filter out all the crazies because there's, there's a lot of those in, in any online forum. <laughs> and, 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 and I have never seen it more evenly split um, because I think all of us want the right to privacy. That's sort of a fundamental right in this country, and that's something we value and take very seriously. But everybody also understands kind of that this is sort of a known terrorism case. And then there's this whole complicated debate about, well, the phone actually belonged to the county and not to the individual because the work-related phone. They've, Apple has already released all the data from the cloud to the FBI. And so now we're talking about what's left on the phone. Uh, and it is a slippery slope. I, if, I, if I'm leaning anywhere and I'm, I have to confess I am completely unsure, I'm on the side of protecting the country. Uh, and I, I'm not saying my wife isn't, uh, but, but, but it's, 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 it's a, uh, 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 I just thought about that, by the way. I, I'm good. Uh, um, uh, she's actually here, so I have to be very cautious. Uh, 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 um, but, but y you know, it, it's not that we don't value security. It's also that this is a slippery slope because if you do create the back door and then the question becomes, where do you stop, right? And, and I can't claim to have the right answer on this one. It is a very, very, but, but it, you know, it goes back in a, in a different kind of way to sort of some of the other questions because we are changing society. And sort of what I want to leave you with is a thought that we often use the, what's called techno-determinism, that technology determines the future, and we often neglect the role of society. And I think 
you know, to a lot of what's been said already, we choose. And we need to make conscious choices about what we allow and don't allow technology to do and, or, or the context that we build around technology. And this is the perfect example for sort of good societal debate, right? Because we do need to agree as a country. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, what you comment upon hacking or hospital paying ransom for hacking? Wow. <laughs> I know what I've done to deserve this. Trans <laughs> it's transcendent. <laughs> I'm going to throw it over to Scott. He's, uh, um, um, I'm against ransom. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's, it's a huge issue, right? I mean, cybersecurity is, um, it's not just criminals and individuals, it's countries engaging in, in cyber warfare. And I think it's, it's uh, again, these are all these questions that I certainly don't claim to be an expert on and are very difficult to answer. But in general, I think ransom is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have, we have a question up. Good morning. My name is Rob Warren. I am from Western University of Health Sciences. Uh, if you're not aware of who we are, don't feel bad. Uh, we're in the business of producing the uh, healthcare professionals of tomorrow. Uh, the way we do that is uh, osteopathic medical school, dental school, optometry school, pharmacy school, uh, graduate nursing school, uh, research as well as veterinary. And one of the ways that we're trying to innovate is since we have all of these professional degrees in one place, um, we're looking at interprofessional education. How do doctors and nurses and care coordinators and dentists and optometrists um, learn together and eventually how are they going to perform in the interprofessional uh, marketplace? So my question is, as a producer of the future workforce, how can um, we partner with uh, future innovators in uh, the employment sector. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I'll take a stab. Um, so we actually have all the practitioners mentioned, we have all those and they do work together. And it was usually the first experience where they had all worked together before we brought them together. So what I think will happen is that in the future, new models that allow these previously disparate services to now practice together are gonna uh, create the opportunities for the, the folks that you're training to actually be able to practice that way. Uh, what we found was that physical therapists never talk to chiropractors because in the real world they compete, but in our world they actually work together. That was new for them. So a new business model created an opportunity for these two professionals to now work together in ways they hadn't previously. I see that synergy across multiple other disciplines, bringing the pharmacist in, bringing other health providers in uh, to the mix is actually critically important. I also think the view of primary care is actually changing because dental care is primary care, optometry is primary care. We're diagnosing hypertension, you know, pre-diabetic issues by looking into people's eyes. And that's a powerful part that should be information that the, the whole care team has. So I applaud your efforts. You know, we, we should probably talk because we're always looking for great providers afterwards, but uh, I'll go from there, so thanks. We have another question. As I uh, marveled at uh, Stephen Schaefer showing what Watson could do in healthcare from Stanford. It occurred to me that the uh, some of this data is going to come from enterprise EHR systems, which are deployed in a variety of ways. And most of the deployments I'm aware of do not offer anything re resembling credible database query or even natural language search. Not to mention usability engineering that no one would buy were it a consumer product. So how do you get the big data to be fed by the EHR silo data and have it be worthwhile? So, so there's any number of companies working on that right now. Um, and I think that, you're at, by the way, this is not just a, a healthcare or a medical pro industry problem. You go to any industry that's been around for a few years and our tech and data infrastructure is not amenable 
to the kinds of things we're talking about. And I think there's a lot of companies that are working right now, uh, including some fabulous research going on at UCI by building some of these big data architectures that will, the, the thing you want to do is you want to be able to pull from all the work that, you want to pull the data from all the sort of the established databases and infrastructure that we have today without sort of reinventing everything. And so, I mean, think about it in the following way. Every time you or I go to a sort of a, an online travel uh, engine, they're all using the same one of three different engines built 30, 40 years ago. So we have found ways where the commercial need is important to, f to be able to do the kinds of things that we're talking about. It's much more complicated in healthcare, I get that. Uh, but I think, those, I think that's really not the challenge. It's, 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 it's sort of the Scott point about new ways of organizing and new ways of doing business. The technology will get solved. I'm hoping the big data initiative will drive the computer data. Right. Correct. I wanted it to. Yes. Thank you. We have one last question. Hi, I'm Will Ixon. I'm from the Society of Hospital Medicine, and we're in the business of training our nation's 50,000 hospitalists on all the things they didn't learn in medical school. So this is for the two educators. Uh, when we want to have every hospitalist have a bedside <coughs> ultrasound so they can do this, the, the educators tell us they can't afford to, to supply the residents with that tool during their training, so they have to learn that. When we try to teach people how to look at data and analyze it, they've never learned this in medical school. You know, somebody else mentioned, when, they, when we try to talk to them about providing care in a team, it's like they didn't know that there was a nursing school over here or a physical therapy. How do you see, I see technology and the capability of what an individual practitioner can do, so much further ahead, when you talk about Flexner, it's like the medical schools are trapped. They, ha they haven't gotten to the 21st century. I'm not even sure they got to the 20th century. So what, what would make me, as a consumer of healthcare in the future, because I'm now on Medicare, think that the medical students who are in school now are gonna be able to absorb these innovations during their medical school years and their residency years. Do you see some hope on that front? Let me take that question. Um, it's a very um, uh, insightful question. Uh, I go to medical school often with colleagues, and I basically get an essential question, which can be summarized like this. Is there a course a students can do in medical uh, program that will teach them computer science? And I say, you know, is there a course I can make my surgeons out of my computer scientist? Uh, and and uh, that's the problem. Uh, and I'll tell you how we're solving it. Uh, we often take a 40,000 feet view of domains that are remote from us, and somehow we think that we can learn Java or, or uh, Wikipedia or something, and we know end of computer science, to be able to practice, to be able to navigate data. When reality is, it is really the slog that you did in calculus in our high school before you could even use more than your fingers to do arithmetic. So <clears throat> how do you solve that problem institutionally? So this is one of the most fascinating initiatives that I've driven, which is beyond robotics, and it's called, uh, at UCSD, it's called Precision Medicine. If you type UCSD Precision Medicine, you will see today eight faculty positions advertised. In last, and we are hiring for eight separate faculty members, in last uh, five years, we have hired three faculty members who are split directly between computer science, half-time, and half-time school of medicine, pediatrics, pharmacy, um, uh, cellular and molecular medicine. And so they are forced to work with the students across the two domains because that's the only way you can bring in the, the, uh, the awareness that you need in an institution that this knowledge needs to be communicated, this needs to be put into the practice of our curriculum. If you're not, you're gonna create really uh, talent that is uh, so naive on one side or the other. And on, that really goes back to how our education and degrees have been structured, but they are changing, and they're changing rapidly. We're going to have to stop there. Thank you. Thank all our panelists.